the recording now. <clears throat> right, so it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Marco Pangallo, um, <clears throat> who um, has a BSc in physics and an MSc in complex systems, both from the University of uh, Turin. In, in Turin. Um, <clears throat> and then he did a PhD with uh, Don Farmer at, um, at Oxford at the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Um, and that he completed that in 2019, the, the DPhil. And then since uh, sort of 2020, he is a, a James S. McDonnell postdoc fellow um, at the Institute um, of Economics at the Santa Ana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. And today he's going to talk about the title that is on the on the slide, Does Learning Converge to Equilibrium in Generic Games? So the, the screen is yours, Marco. Thank you, Tobias. Uh, you already uh, introduced me uh, very nicely. Um, so the, the, the thing I can add is, uh, as Tobias mentioned, they're really uh, straddling between the complex systems and economics uh, communities. Uh, and uh, um, so I, I also have some work which is uh, more empirical and some work which is more theoretical. So today we will just be talking about uh, one of my lines of research, uh, which is actually something I collaborated uh, with Tobias as well. Um, but, uh, but, 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 you know, I, I'm also doing something else on agent based models, uh, synchronization and, uh, and so on. Um, this is unfortunately a webinar, so there will be limited chances for interaction, but they will be in Lyon uh, at the Complex Systems Conference next week. So if any of you are there and you would like to get in touch, please uh, uh, just uh, drop me an email and we can uh, definitely uh, meet there. Um, so just to give you some background uh, on my talk, um, the concept of equilibrium is really a key concept in, in economic and financial theory. If you just take a random uh, economics uh, paper these days, you will probably read the word equilibrium uh, like 20 times. So this is because uh, the, um, uh, you know, economists really like to build models uh, in which um, um, the, everything is very well disciplined. And uh, the concept of equilibrium is very different in economics than in the natural sciences. It has nothing to do with stationarity or with a steady state. It's more something that has to do with the mutual consistency between the beliefs of the agents, the actions they take, and the uh, outcomes. So it, it's a very general concept. But as a complex system scientist, I have some problems with it because uh, if uh, equilibrium is ever a good description of the system, I would want it to be achieved uh, by uh, agents uh, who, you know, can reach it in, in a bottom-up way and not being imposed top-down on the system as it is often uh, done. So really, a, a key question to me for, for a complex system approach to economics is wondering where, whether this uh, concept of equilibrium in, and in which situations uh, it is a reasonable description of the system. And to make this very general question a scientific one, uh, I've been focusing on game theory. Game theory is a, a very general framework, which uh, can be used to study interdependent choices in economics, but, but even in biology. I mean, it's, uh, it's just, just a very general framework. And then in this case, the question is, uh, let's assume that the game is repeated many times and then players are done, and will they converge to equilibrium over time or will they not? Now, when economists uh, study this question, they really focus on uh, classes of games. So they, they really like uh, kind of simplifying the problem and, uh, and focus on certain classes of games which have economic interest and which have, at the same time allow some analytical tractability. So we are, I'm just highlighting a sentence from the abstract of the paper that was published in the Top Economic Theory Journal, which states that they study equilibrium in classes of games that include coordination games, dominant solvable games, games with strategic complementarities, potential games, and many others with applications in economics, biology, and distributed control. So really, the, the approach uh, that is taken is to study Study whether uh, players converge to equilibrium in these uh, classes of games. And uh, let, so I, I just want to be concrete and, uh, and explain you uh, what this means with an example. This is a paper that I've been working on with Tobias and with my PhD supervisor, Don Farmer. This is the first chapter of my PhD thesis. So we started looking at two by two games. 
I guess most of you will know what a game is, but to, just to give a quick uh, uh, recap, a game is composed of uh, players, in this case, just two players, which we will name row and column. And then each player will have uh, two actions, S1 and S2. And then each uh, combination of actions by the two players will uh, uh, result in a payoff. So what you see here is just a, a payoff matrix. So for instance, uh, if you focus on this cell of the payoff matrix BG, then B is the payoff that player row will receive there is as a result of playing action S1 against action S2. And then G is the payoff that player con will receive under the same combination of actions. And I will also be using a different representation of a payoff matrix just with brackets uh, for simplicity. Now, what does it mean? So let's say that this game is played multiple times. What does it mean that players learn? Now, a possible uh, way for players to learn a very popular learning rule is experience-weighted attraction. Um, this is essentially a dynamical system that describes the learning dynamics. Uh, this algorithm assumes that there is a, a variable that is common to all players that is named experience, which is just something increasing monotonically. And uh, then there are other quantities named uh, attractions, uh, which are essentially capturing the interest uh, that player mu has towards any action i. So, um, for instance, so, so the, the, the attractions uh, update in the following way. Th there is, first of all, a memory loss term. So players may uh, forget what uh, their um, attractions are and you know, did you just forget about past play? And then there is a reinforcement term, which is basically um, telling you um, that the actions that yielded better payoffs uh, are going to be are going to be more likely in the future. So this is really the idea behind the reinforcement learning. EWA adds a twist to it uh, in that you both consider actions that you played and you also construct kind of a mental model of the foregone payoffs. So you ask yourself, if I had played another action, what, what would have happened? So EWA, and then the, the final, oops, the, the final bit is uh, uh, a, a mapping from these attractions to probabilities uh, to, to play certain actions, which happens uh, through a logit function, uh, which you know, in statistical mechanics may, may be called, called Boltzmann distribution. Um, so essentially, we have this dynamical system, which you know depends on the number of uh, players and actions, and uh, it may converge over time to a steady state to an equilibrium, or, or it may not converge. And uh, as we'll see, this depends really on the class of game. So uh, all two player to action games can be uh, clustered into four groups. Um, we have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, either we have, for instance, coordination, anti-coordination, and dominance solvable, and finally, uh, cyclic games. And uh, you know, to, to to put a game into one of these classes, you look at the ordering of uh, payoffs. So, for instance, if uh, payoff A is greater than payoff C, and payoff D is greater than payoff B, and at the same time, payoff E is greater than G, and H is greater than F then this is going to be a coordination game with two uh, Nash uh, equilibria. Um, it will also have a mixed equilibrium. So yeah, I, I'm just showing uh, a, a plot in a, a two-dimensional plot of, uh, of mixed strategies where triangles are, are, are Nash equilibrium so that they, they uh, are placed in a certain uh, way. Um, then uh, we may also have an anti-coordination game, which is kind of similar, but with the equilibrium in different positions. We may have a dominant solvable game, which has just one unique pure strategy, Nash equilibrium. And finally, a cyclic game, uh, which has no pure strategy equilibrium. I, I will go back to that, but let me just show you some results of our analysis. So essentially what we do is uh, trying to classify the type of uh, learning dynamics depending on uh, the parameters of the learning rule as well as the parameters of the game. Now, don't worry too much about what is on the axis, just uh, accept it's going to be some combinations of game payoffs, which uh, then distinguishes certain areas uh, in this diagram 
uh, that uh, refer to the different classes of games that I showed in the previous slide. Different colors here indicate the outcome of learning dynamics. So for instance, in games that have uh, the, the, these parameters A and B, because everything is blue, it means that there are multiple steady states of experience weighted attraction. In the yellow area, there is just a, a one clause to pure strategies, to, to pure Nash equilibria. And then in the green area, uh, you know, people mix between directions. Now, this is just, a, you know, I. The, the, I could give an entire talk on this paper, but I just wanted to convey the message that in these classes of games, there is always convergence to something, often close to the equilibria. Now, under other parameters, it's instead and specifically under parameters of games that, uh, uh, that define cyclic games, it's instead possible to get non-convergence. So instead of converging to a steady state, then Experience weighted attraction learning either for those limit cycles, uh, as in the top time series, or uh, low dimensional chaos, uh, as in the bottom uh, time series. So it, it seems uh, that really the, the class of game is indeed a, a, an important feature uh, trying to understand the uh, outcome of uh, learning dynamics. And uh, so I, I realized in my PhD that. Uh, um, um, it was uh, maybe possible to, to kind of generalize this idea. Now, le let me introduce you to a concept, uh, the best reply uh, structure. Um, so now, this, this, these are the same classes of games that I was showing some uh, slides ago. But in addition to the uh, example payoffs, I'm also drawing some arrows. Uh, you, you can also think of it as a best reply graph. Uh, well, the arrows depend on the ordering of payoffs uh, again. So um, for instance, uh, because five is greater than one, then we draw a vertical arrow in this matrix because uh, essentially um, it means that the, the player, player row deciding uh, which action to play uh, prefers to play the, the action at the top than the action at the bottom. So that's why I draw a vertical line here. And at the same time, the, the column player prefers uh, pay of five to pay of one. And so we, we draw a horizontal line because a uh, 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 player column prefers to play the action on the left than the action on the right. And then likewise, you can build uh, all other uh, 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 lines. And in this case, a coordination game has two fixed points in this graph, which correspond to the pure strategy in Asia equilibria, which are located on the main diagonal. Well, in the case of an anti-coordination game, it's kind of the same, but the two uh, fixed points are located on the uh, off diagonal. In the case of a dominant solvable game, uh, um, there is just one pure equilibrium, one fixed point at the top left in this example. But then there is the, the, this case of the cyclic game where experience weighted attraction was following limit cycles or chaos. And in this case, uh, um, we, we instead have a cycle. Uh, you know, if, uh, if the players start at this point, then player column will move here, player row will move here, player column will move here, player row will, will move here. And the cycle, if the players follow the, this graph, will basically repeat itself uh, indefinitely. So what I wondered in my PhD was whether we could kind of generalize this intuition from two by two games into more general games with multiple actions and just two players. So I was wondering, let's take a game like this one, which is a game with 11 actions per player and with a very complicated best reply structure. And what can we say about whether learning will converge to some equilibrium or not? Um, now, of course, in the case of two by two games, we were able to exhaustively classify all games into one of four uh, classes. Uh, this is no longer possible in the case of uh, uh, high dimensional games. And so we instead follow an approach that is very standard in complex systems, which is we generate uh, uh, games at random. So we basically sample the space of games uh, under uh, a, a, a set of assumptions. We, we define an ensemble of games. When we put no constraints, this could be a null model of generic situations that can be modeled as games. So if you know nothing about your system, except uh, it's a set of interdependent choices that can be modeled as a normal form game, then you may just uh, assume 
to understand these properties, th that to understand these properties, you just want to draw games at random, or you may have additional information about your system, and then you can include that information as a constraint on the uh, way to generate payoffs. So for instance, if you know that payoffs are going to be correlated, then you can take that into account when you generate games. This is um, a very standard approach in statistical mechanics. Uh, it's also a very common approach in uh, studying the stability of ecosystems. Uh, um, th there is this pioneering paper by May, which found that as, uh, 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 as randomly generated ecosystems became larger, they would become unstable. But this was a conundrum because uh, if you look at the rainforest, which is a very complicated ecosystem, you don't see mass extinctions from one day from one day to another, so it's a relatively stable system. But uh, then uh, uh, how do you reconcile this with theoretical evidence? Uh, and that's what set off an entire line of research that was trying to incorporate uh, um, uh, properties of real world ecosystems into the way ecosystems were generated, and then checking whether this was leading to stability. There is a paper by Sam Johnson and, and others uh, which uh, goes in the direction of solving this uh, problem. So we want to do something similar in game theory. And uh, again, to do that, we need to develop some uh, quite simple um, with, I found it useful to develop a quite simple uh, approach to understanding uh, how common convergence is uh, in uh, uh, large dimensional games. So this was really uh, the concept of the uh, best reply structure. Now, again, this is a game uh, like you saw before with three actions per player. And again, the arrows uh, indicate uh, best replies. So for instance, uh, this arrow goes to the top because payoff 0.2 is greater than payoff minus 0.1 or payoff 0.1. And again, we color the arrows red if they are part of the cycle, blue if they lead to a fixed point, and then, well, orange if they lead to the cycle. Now, in this case, the players have three actions, and the two actions are involved in a cycle. One action is involved in a fixed point. So we can just make up a very simple metric, which is uh, which we call share of best reply cycles, which in this case is just uh, two, two out of three. And uh, then we can simulate uh, several learning dynamics, uh, starting from different initial conditions. So players uh, start with a certain probability to play one of the actions, and then we just uh, iterate the dynamical system. And then you see, uh, for instance, uh, in this example, uh, starting from some initial conditions, they end up in, the, in a unique fixed point, which corresponds uh, to this uh, uh, Nash equilibrium. In other cases, they follow some uh, um, cyclical dynamics, uh, which uh, corresponds uh, to this uh, cycle. And this is not only true for experience weighted attraction, which uh, I have already talked about. We also consider the multiple other uh, rules, such as Bushman Steller reinforcement learning. We also consider the replicated dynamics, which is very common in biology. Um, we also consider the fictitious play. In this case, uh, uh, so the, the one thing I haven't said is that in this uh, plot, uh, where, where on the axis you have probabilities to play certain actions. Uh, the dots uh, are the Nash equilibria. So it turns out fictitious play can reach uh, a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So the theory is not perfect, but our claim is that uh, you can understand the probability that all of these learning rules converge to a fixed point or remain stuck in a cycle because you can get a sense of the size of the respective basins of attraction counting the number of moves that are parts of the best reply cycles versus uh, uh, best reply uh, fixed points. And this holds up uh, quantitatively. So this is just a scatter plot in which on uh, each panel is a learning rule. And then on the horizontal axis, you have the share of best reply cycles or many best reply cycles your game has relative to best reply fixed points. And on the y-axis, you have uh, the frequency in, of non-converging dynamics. So the, the number of times the, 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 the dynamics is red as opposed uh, to being blue or green. And as you see, there is a relatively strong uh, correlation. Uh, I'm not going into details about this plot uh, because uh, you know um, th th there's a lot going on, but the only message I want to give is that um, uh, counting the, 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 the type of, uh, uh, the, the, this kind of topological property, because really 
what you measure in is uh, a property of the graph uh, is uh, predictive of convergence of uh, quite uh, complicated dynamical systems, uh, such as the uh, experience weighted attraction one that I showed in one of the initial uh, slides. Now, if uh, you take, if you believe this, then the question of the validity of equilibrium, the question of whether equilibrium is reached as uh, the outcome of the learning process uh, can be asked by wondering which games are prevalent. So, um, are games on the left prevalent? These are games with no best supply cycles. And these are the games that are studied by most of the literature, such as potential games, dominance games, and so on. Or is it more common to find games such as the ones on the right, which instead have a lot of the cycles, which we know prevent convergence? Um, now, you, you can use the statistical mechanics to address this question because uh, you can essentially compute all the uh, ways to generate uh, this type of best reply graphs. Uh, so this is kind of a microcanonical assumption uh, in which you basically assume that each possible way to place these arrows has the same probability, and you just count the number of ways in which, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the, the top row here as a best reply here, and then the, the, the other rows have the uh, best replies in other, in other positions. And so you can come up with formulas, uh, which for instance tell you uh, how many games have at least one cycle as the number of actions increases. Um, so uh, what this uh, uh, plot is showing is that the bigger the game becomes, the higher the frequency of games with uh, cycles, and you can characterize this uh, fully analytically. And then if you also plot uh, the uh, frequency of convergence of the learning rules, you see that you don't see any convergence. So essentially, um, the, the, the bigger the game, the, the, the bigger the game becomes, the less likely is that best reply dynamics and uh, the other learning rules that I mentioned uh, converge to an equilibrium. This is also to um, if you change the correlation of the payoffs. Uh, um, so the, the, there is this paper by uh, Tobias and, and Doin where they change this key parameter, which is uh, how much the payoffs are correlated, uh, which is the, the, this parameter gamma here. Now, if the correlation goes up, uh, then it means that the incentives of, of the players are aligned because uh, uh, what is good for me is also good for you. Well, as this parameter becomes more negative, then uh, the uh, incentives start to become misaligned because what is good for me tends to be uh, bad for you. And, um, and so in this case, you can also compute the frequency of uh, uh, best reply uh, cycles. So, you know, in this plot, I was just showing for simplicity, the fraction of, the, of games in which there was at least one cycle as this parameter is varied. And you see that uh, the, the more uh, uh, correlated the, the, the payoffs become, the um, less likely it is to find cycle, while with negative payoffs, the, the cycles are extremely common. And uh, um, so if you just uh, consider the baseline case, uh, which, where you don't consider any payoff correlation and you just make up games at random, and uh, so I think in this case, we are considering quite large games, then games with no cycles are a very tiny fraction of uh, uh, the ensemble. So the classes of games that have been uh, uh, extensively considered in the literature, such as uh, uh, potential, dominance, coordination, and supermodular games are, are really a tiny fraction of, uh, of that ensemble. So whether you uh, want to believe that generating games at random or, or, or is something meaningful, it's interesting to note that the, 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 the type of games that are studied most extensively is, uh, uh, is quite a, a strong minority. Now, uh, I started working on these two papers in my PhD, and then uh, some master students uh, uh, did their thesis uh, on, uh, on these ideas, and, uh, and we worked together on extending the, the framework to uh, multiplayer games and, and to games on net. So we'll just uh, show you some results of a new working paper. Um, so, one thing, for instance, uh, uh, is uh, the, the, the case in which you have uh, uh, three players 
and uh, we assume that all players uh, are connected to all other players. And then what before was uh, a payoff matrix now becomes a three-dimensional matrix. Um, and uh, the, what we do is, uh, if you just look at uh, one of these matrices, it's uh, the same as before, but then you add the player level further to player row and the player column. So essentially, um, the, the first payoff now is the payoff that row receives, the second payoff is the payoff that column receives, and the third payoff is the payoff that uh, level receives. So for instance, because uh, four is better than minus two, you can draw a vertical arrow here. And then again, even in three dimensions, you may have the best reply cycles or fixed points. And again, I'm following the convention that I'm drawing cycles in red and fixed points in blue. And um, um, it's interesting that in the case of the two players, the sequence didn't matter because uh, if, uh, 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 at any given time, you have only one player who can improve their payoff. If you start from here, you, you, if you start from the bottom left, you move to, to, to the top left, then it's only the other player that can play and then they just end up in equilibrium. Now, what happens in this case uh, can be different because uh, if you have a sequence in which the first move is player row, then the, the player moves here, the, then it's time of player column, pl player column moves here, then it's the time of player level. Now player level is uh, best responding. Indeed, there is a vertical arrow here. And, and so they, they, they remain here. And, and then essentially they remain stuck in the cycle. But if instead the order was that player row goes first and then player level goes, they would end up at the equilibrium. So uh, you see that in this case, the, the sequence matters. And so we wrote the paper in which we, uh, we study um, convergence of best reply dynamics and of learning rules uh, um, when the best reply dynamics has different uh, sequences. And uh, so we, the, the, the notation here is that we consider M actions and uh, N players. Um, a random sequence is such that you just pick a player at random. And uh, in this case, uh, the literature says that convergence is almost sure as games become large. So intuitively here, if you just uh, have a random sequence at, at some point uh, when you are in this position, it will be player level who would play and then they would end up here. Um, so in two, but by the way, this uh, study of a random sequence is kind of a percolation problem. So in a high dimensional hypercube, uh, which is directed, the, the question is whether you end up in a, in a fixed point in a sink. What, uh, what we did instead was consider in the clockwork sequence uh, and we find the opposite result. We find that in big games, the best reply dynamics almost never converges. So a, a situation such as the red one is much more common as the games become larger. And in fact, we are able to prove a theorem that gives uh, a pre precise bounds uh, on the probability of convergence. Uh, and, and as you see, because uh, this uh, term m to the n minus one is at the denominator in the bounds, as uh, m n goes to infinity, the probability of convergence will go to zero. Now, because these bounds only depend on the uh, on this uh, on this formula on the on m to the n minus one, we were able also to find the scaling relation, which we found was very interesting. This was uh, a, the main idea of the uh, master thesis of Luca Mungo. Um, we would um, basically okay. So here you see uh, convergence to a pure Nash equilibrium. Across, uh, uh, it, across different settings, uh, depending on, uh, oh, oh, so let's start uh, looking at the top plot. And um, what you see on the x-axis is just the number of actions. So games become uh, bigger with, with, with more actions. And then the different uh, uh, lines refer to different uh, uh, number of players. So um, convergence becomes uh, less common as you increase the number of players, so as you move uh, uh, in this way, or as you increase the number of actions. 
Now, you can rescale actions in a given way, and you kind of find the sort of the universality relations where it doesn't really matter um, the, the, like um, whether you consider in a certain number of players or actions, but it's essentially the, the, the term uh, m to the n minus one which, uh, which matters. And so, because this result was asymptotic, it's also interesting to uh, see that it holds uh, uh, quite well uh, also in, uh, in simulations. Uh, but really, so here the, the additional message, uh, the additional key message with respect to the previous results is that not only when the number of actions increases, but also when the number of players increases, then the basic dynamics under a clockwork sequence uh, is less likely to converge. And uh, so you may say, why should we care about uh, the best applied dynamics having a clockwork sequence as opposed to, for instance, a random sequence? It turns out again that we can predict the, the convergence frequency of learning rules, such as uh, Bush must tell the reinforcement learning, fictitious play, or replicator dynamics uh, using the clockwork sequence, uh, while it's uh, more difficult. Uh, to uh, predict them using the random sequence, in particular in uh, uh, high-dimensional games with many players and many actions, uh, these learning rules are very uh, are very unlikely to converge, and uh, um, this is also uh, true for the clockwork best applied dynamics, but not for uh, the other versions of best applied dynamics. So basically, the the thing is. The, the pattern that the convergence frequency of learning rules and of best applied dynamics also holds uh, in uh, multiplayer games. And so, and, and games with many players tend to have little convergence sequence. Now, I think if I want to talk for 40 minutes, then I probably still have about uh, five minutes. So I just want to talk about uh, network games. We haven't uh, put up any uh, paper out yet on this, but uh, uh, we, 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 this, this is kind of preliminary work. Now, uh, having a network game means, so for instance, uh, you, you, you may remember before I was showing a, a, a three player game in which all players were connected, in particular row and column were connected to, to one another. Um, now, I'm considering the case in which uh, uh, row and column are collected to player level, but they are not collected connected to one another. Now, how this tra translates uh, into the payoff uh, uh, matrix? Uh, well, essentially, the thing is that rows payoffs uh, cannot be influenced by column, and columns payoffs cannot be influenced by row. So for instance, if uh, uh, under uh, a given uh, action S2 of player level, then uh, player row may have payoff five, or if he plays S1, or payoff three if he plays S2. But then this uh, also has to hold for S2C. Meaning, in other words, you, this number and this number must be the same because row and column are not connected. And so changing the action of column should not change the payoff of row. And so this imposes an additional structure on the payoffs. And uh, of course, it potentially changes uh, the uh, convergence properties of best applied dynamics and of other learning rules. Um, in uh, in uh, this case, uh, um, in fact, it made the game much more convergent. So basically, to obtain this game, I started from uh, this game, which had a cycle, and they just changed the payoffs uh, so that they were consistent uh, with the uh, uh, network uh, of the players. And indeed, you see that we have no longer a cycle. And instead, uh, starting from any initial condition, you always end up uh, at, uh, at the unique uh, uh, pure strategy in equilibrium. In this case, I'm drawing uh, uh, light blue uh, arrows that eventually lead uh, to the unique fixed point. Now we are able to characterize convergence uh, um, in uh, in this case, and uh, what the, the 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 key result is that the denser the network, uh, the sorry here there is a type. So the, 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 this should be actually 
less convergence. I'm changing it so that it doesn't uh, create uh, confusion. Um, so in other words, the, the more uh, you have the, the the closer the network is to a complete network the, the less likely you you converge so if i just draw attention on the on the left plot you uh, can see that um so th there are two things that are worth seeing. the first is comparing the uh, dashed lines with the solid lines uh, independent of the color so in this case we are just comparing the best supply dynamics and the replicator dynamics and uh, here the what you want to see is that the two lines move uh, in uh, parallel if you look at blue solid and blue dashed and green solid and green dashed they kind of move uh, in parallel and this again is telling you that studying specified dynamics gives you information about in this case replicator dynamics but this also holds for the other learnings. the other thing you want to compare is the different colors so the blue case is uh, the complete network so every player is connected to all other players the green case uh, is the uh, is a ring network and uh, as you see the rate of non-convergence is higher if the network is complete so the 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 more the, the less dense the network uh, the higher the convergence now on the right plot you see something similar my apologies uh, this on the y-axis shows the variability of convergence so here you had non-convergence so what, what goes up here should go down here and you see that the more edges uh, you add in the network uh, for a given number of players the more uh, it's likely that you the less is likely that you converge so indeed, this again gives the same message. And uh, so this, uh, you can also prove analytically for a few games and for a few playing sequences, this was the uh, bachelor thesis of Eugene Young, who, was, uh, a, who had a very interesting idea, which was, uh, um, let's consider bipartite networks and bipartite playing sequences. So for instance, uh, if you look at the, uh, the network on the left, this is just a ring, and you can color the uh, nodes of the ring in red or blue, which are the two groups of nodes. Uh, now, of course, this is a bipartite network because uh, uh, red nodes are not connected to one another, and the same is true for blue nodes. And if you assume that first all red players uh, play, and then all blue players play, then you can analytically characterize uh, uh, the convergence uh, frequency and the same is true for any other bipartite network or, or playing sequence so in a star for instance if you assume that the uh, central player goes first and then the leaf players uh, go next or in a grid if you assume a division such as uh, such as this one then uh, you can basically analytically calculate uh, the frequency of convergence of uh, of best reply uh, dynamics uh, uh, in these cases. So really, um, to, to conclude, um, we, the, the, the reason for asking the question of whether learning converges to equilibrium is uh, uh, important uh, as a, a theoretical justification for equilibrium, e equilibrium is much more natural if it can be reached uh, as a fixed point uh, of some learning dynamics than if uh, you must just assume it uh, from the start. What we find is that in two by two games under experience weighted attraction, convergence is often uh, likely, except in the case of uh, cyclic games under some parameters. Then we find that when we uh, generate uh, ensembles of games, uh, then uh, we can use these uh, uh, best supply dynamics, these uh, share of best reply cycles respect to fixed points to predict the convergence of several uh, uh, learning rules, not just experience weighted attraction, but also uh, replicator dynamics, reinforcement learning, fictitious play, and so on. Um, we find then that best supply cycles become dominant as uh, the number of actions uh, and players is increased and as the network uh, where which connects the players becomes uh, denser 
And so the high level conclusion of this is that uh, as long as we believe that uh, random games generated under either no constraints or some constraints on so some negative constraints on pay of uh, description of some economic uh, and financial settings, then just the assuming equilibrium may be a poor description of the system. Just wanted to conclude with a few ideas on how to develop uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this line of research. Um, th th there are a number of uh, questions that uh, basically try to better understand why we can predict the convergence frequency of, for instance, replicated dynamics using the uh, number of best reply cycles that the pay of metrics has. Um, the, I don't know if any of you is, uh, is an experimentalist, but uh, I would really like at some point to, to, to run some experiments with human players uh, where we uh, give them randomly generated games and we try to predict whether, uh, to, to, to see whether the, the, the best reply structure is predictive of the convergence frequency in, uh, in these games. Um, so far, the only constraint that we considered when generating ensembles of games has been the correlation of the payoffs. But it would be interesting to consider alternative constraints. We did something on potential gains, but th th there is a lot to be done. And finally, as is uh, always uh, nice when you do complex systems research, it would be interesting to bring these ideas from a, a set, from the setting where they were originally thought, which is game theory, and see whether they, 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 they can be connected to other feeds, to other ideas. So for instance, there is a theory of qualitative stability in ecology, which uh, tells you that you don't need all information on food webs to predict stability of the food web, but you just need to know whether a certain relation is predator or prey. And in a sense, this is similar to what we do with the best reply structure, where we kind of ignore the specific values of the payoffs, and we just see what's the highest value of a, of a given payoff. And then there might be also a connection with random matrix theory, uh, uh, because uh, the, the, the way the payoff matrices are uh, uh, at certain cycles uh, is connected to their eigenvalues. So this is uh, all from me. Um, I'm happy to uh, take uh, questions. I hope the presentation was clear. I couldn't, of course, see any reactions. So I just went on speaking for 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I'm, I, I'm happy to get questions. All right. well, thank you, Marco, for this uh, nice talk. Um, so if anybody has a question, I propose you just unmute yourself and, and ask. Um, so who, who wants to go first? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can. Okay, uh, thank you for the talk, very interesting. Um, I just was wondering what, if it is possible to generalize this to the grand canonical. I mean, if uh, the number of action is not fixed and Maybe at um, any uh, time one player has to make an action, a, a new action can arise. It is possible to not maybe generalize the best reply uh, technique because uh, I guess it, it will change the, the whole best reply structure, but maybe what is the probability that a new action will change the best reply structure? <laughs> This is a really interesting idea I never uh, thought about. Um, yeah, the gun canonical ensemble would, uh, would be an interesting uh, extension. When, when I gave this talk at some, at some point, uh, I was uh, uh, even proposed to, to consider the canonical ensemble. So now, now we have all the ensembles. Um, yeah, I, I agree that in a sense, if you do it with the best reply structure where everything is discrete uh, and you just create a given action, which by the way is a very interesting uh, uh, question economically because uh, th th there may be many games in which at some point uh, th th there is a new possibility. So the, the, the payoff metrics so far in, the, in this talk was fixed, but it would be interesting in many cases to uh, consider a drawing or a shrinking uh, payoff metrics as the game is played. Um, but so it, with the standard best reply structure, you may 
by creating actions, which is something discrete, the, the, there is a lot of discontinuity from, from one thing to another. So uh, as you said, it might be, uh, it might create some problems. Uh, it might be that instead the type of uh, uh, path integral analysis that uh, Tobias did with Doin in his uh, uh, PNAS paper, where you uh, just consider um, uh, the, the specific values of payoffs that may be more continuous. So, so it might be easier to deal with in this type of grand canonical set. This, this is just the, the, I don't know, some ideas that came to my mind uh, to, to, to address your question, but uh, I haven't really given a lot of thought to, uh, to this possibility yet. Thank you. Very interesting question. <laughs> yeah. so, so there's a, <clears throat> a question in the chat that I can, read out if I understood the trajectories. Yeah, the person doesn't have a, a microphone. Tomek, if I understood the trajectories in your work assume mixed strategies, but in experimental work, people usually have two or more pure strategies to choose from. How would you see a comparison between your convergence results and such experiments? <laughs> yeah, so this is something we gave uh, a, a lot of thought about. Um, so let me come back to this plot. So this plot was showing the uh, non-convergence, uh, the dynamics of six uh, learning rules uh, against uh, the uh, frequency of, uh, of best reply cycles. In my talk, I mostly focused on four learning rules, which were reinforcement learning, thick tissues play replicated dynamics and DWA, but then there are two more learning rules, which we considered one level K the EWA, uh, Let's, uh, let's forget about this for the moment. But then the other one is uh, EWA with noise. Now, what we mean in this case is precisely what it means. So we know that players cannot play any strategy. They must choose from one of their uh, pure strategies. Now, to, um, uh, to do it, essentially, they just sample from uh, the mixed strategy vector. So if their mixed strategy vector is point if, if we're talking about the two action game and their strategy vector is 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.4, then with 60% probability, they get the first, uh, the, they are going to play the first action. And in fact, you can even study intermediate cases where, uh, the, in, so in a sense, uh, the deterministic limit in which you study mixed strategies, uh, in, in which you just uh, explore the dynamics of mixed strategies is a case in which players play against each other infinite times before updating their attractions. And then you can do something in between, like assuming a given number of samples, which is actually Tobias worked on these and wrote a couple of papers in this direction. But in, in any case, what I wanted to say is that in this case of EWA with noise, we, where indeed players sample one specific pure strategy, the best reply structure is still predictive of the outcome of learning, precisely because of this uh, uh, probability. Uh, I mean, even if, uh, player samples from the mixed strategies, um, uh, they, the, the, the dynamics still follows the, 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 the mixed strategy dynamics in a sense. And so even if everything is bumpier, the, the results don't change much. But yeah, so this is something we definitely, we definitely check. They don't have in the slides some, uh, some plots, some, uh, some dynamics. Uh, uh, um, of, uh, of EWA with noise, but, uh, but, but you can find them in the paper. So thanks for the question. That's an important point. Any, anybody else? Uh, is this, is this, okay. um, so I, I had one, for the, for the games with multiple players, you, you showed some bounds, right? On these probabilities. So can you, well, how do you ca calculate this? Can you say that in a few words without, I mean, obviously going through details, but what methods do you use? Yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, we teamed up uh, with a mathematician, Alexander Scott, <laughs> he's at the Mathematical <laughs> Institute at Oxford. And so he gave the basic idea for doing it. Then our job was uh, to make this idea, which was really combinatorics. It, it was really an analysis on, uh, on uh, hypergraphs. To, to give it uh, a game theory interpretation. But okay, so uh, the key idea is that the, um, there is a coupling. So basically we consider a memoryless random walk on a hypergraph 
and we kind of couple it with the path supply dynamics. So the, the, there are two types of dynamics because in a sense, um, it is equivalent to take the game as given, like from a probabilistic point of view, if you just generate games at random, you can just think in the same way of a given game, which is fixed, and then you explore it through the best supply dynamics, or you may in a sense do a non-line generation of the games, right? So you start at the given point, and then you just make up a best supply hour. So it may be, if uh, let's say that this uh, graph doesn't exist and you start from here, then uh, you know it's uh, either this arrow is uh, uh, going up or it's going down. And so essentially, th th this is equivalent uh, to a process uh, where you kind of move randomly on this hypergraph. And then essentially to compute uh, the two bounds, uh, you need to consider the probability, uh, you need to compute the time it takes to end up at the same point, because then it would mean that you're stuck in a best supply cycle, or the probability that you get to a point where you will get stuck in a fixed point. And then you basically, th th this is where you get the bound, because then, uh, um, well, no, okay. The, the, the reason why this is a bound and this is not an exact result is that uh, you need to do some algebra to essentially uh, say that the probability you can express in a way that is uh, less than uh, uh, what you can compute directly from the random walk argument. Um, so this is like in broad terms, the, the method for computing uh, these, uh, uh, the, 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 there is no way to compute this exactly. This is a well-known problem in combinatorics because when you consider a high dimensional hypercube, you, 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 you can never compute exactly this, uh, this quantity. So that's also why you need bounds and not, uh, uh, but again, yeah, this is, uh, this is something uh, <laughs> that was mainly done by Alexander Scott. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions, comments, anything anybody would like to say? There doesn't seem to be anything. So then uh, thank you uh, again, Marco, for the talk and the discussion. And uh, thanks everybody for attending. Um, as you far as- Just to stay here. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, um, okay, so as far as I'm aware, there's no seminar next week until I'm confused uh, because of the, the complex systems conference where lots of people are going. So I will see you again in two weeks time. <laughs>